I would like to welcome you now to another section related to the CIA review course. In this section, we are going to be discussing the issues and the questions related to conducting internal audit engagement, audit tools and techniques. So we are going to be speaking about different issues, about what kind of evidence you need to collect when you are conducting internal audit, about what kind of techniques you can use to be able to collect this evidence about how important it is to be able to use the right tools and techniques to be able to collect the right information to support your engagement results. So first, let's understand what are the information that you need to collect. Well, the IBBF standards in their performance uh, standards will say that identifying information, internal auditors must identify sufficient, reliable, relevant, useful information to achieve the engagement objective. So four things you need to be able to collect. Number one, sufficient information. When we are speaking about sufficient information, sufficient information is defined in an objective term. The meaning of it, that you need to ensure that information you are collecting, they are actually supporting the engagement results. If you think there's a fraud happening, maybe you need to collect more evidence to be able to prove that fraud happened. If you think that this process is more complex, maybe you need to do more testing to be able to ensure that it's actually working according to the policy. So they say sufficient information is factual, accurate, and con uh, convincing so that the pertinent informed person would reach the same conclusion as the auditor. So for us, when we are trying to test internal auditor to see if he actually collected the sufficient relevant, reliable, useful information, the way for us to do the testing is the following. If we believe this auditor didn't do the right job or he was not doing you know, too professional care, what we need to do in this situation, we bring another auditor and we give him the same kind of audit for him to perform. And if he decided to actually do different testing and gather different information so that way we can say that the person who's actually doing the testing, he failed, he didn't do his job in the right way, he didn't do uh, uh, enough testing, he didn't get, gather the relevant information. So look what they say. They say reliable information is best attainable information through the use of appropriate engagement techniques. So when we are speaking about reliable information, we need to understand which information is more reliable. It depends on the source. Where are you getting this information from? So if you are getting this information from, from uh, independent of the engagement client, they will be more what? They will be more accurate because you are getting some someone outside the organization. If you are getting the information supported by other information, so you have information, let's say, from the client, and you have information supported from the bank, you have information from the client, and you have another information supporting that from the supplier, we can rely on it more because in that way we have different parties supporting the information. If you have direct observation or examination by the auditor, so in that way, for you as an auditor, you notice that this is happening, you observe the inventory, and you did examination for the inventory, you evaluated the inventory, so that way this is more reliable than for an, uh, the client to say, here uh, is a list of the items that you have in the inventory. Also, if you have the original documents, it's more reliable than having just a, a copy. So this is when we are speaking about the reliability on the information. We need to ensure that the information you are collecting, they are reliable. Then they say we need to collect relevant information. Relevant information support the engagement observation and recommendation and is consistent with the objective or, uh, for the engagement. So relevant information is all about ensuring that this information that you are collecting actually is useful, is supporting our audit. Uh, and finally, the useful information helps the organization meet the objective. So relevant and useful, they are they come together. Relevant information, this information is relevant to the kind of testing that you are doing. So if you are doing completeness tests, if you are doing uh, you know existence tests, you need to collect the relevant information to this test. And useful information, this uh, information should help us in achieving our objective of the audit. So now, what are the sources of information? Where you can get the information from? This is a very important part to ensure the information you are collecting is coming from the right sources. So here, based on what we are looking at the sources, we are saying which source is more powerful, is gonna provide us more ability to rely on the information that we are getting from and which source is not. 
the, the uh, internal information, the information we obtain from the client, these are the weakest kind of information that we can rely on. So information that the client will provide you from their internal record, information that the client provides you based on the invoices that they generated, information based on you know, the, uh, the reports that they have. We can rely on this information, but actually we can't rely 100% on it. We need to check and verify because these information generated directly by the client. If we have other kind of information, like internal, external information. So internal, external information are documents actually created or, uh, and generated by the client, but they are verified by the by third party. So let's say a client, he writes a check, and after that the check went through the bank and the bank was able to clear this check. So now we have cancelled checks, so this cancelled check we can consider it as internal, external because the client created this and after that it was verified through the system. What about external, internal information? We can rely on it more. These are documentations created by third party, let's say you know the supplier, let's say it's the customer and after that went through the client system and processed. So the, the level of reliance on it as external and internal more than internal and external. And we have external information. External information are information generated by third party. So we go to the bank and we get the bank statement related to the organization. We go to third party and we get information they have related to the operation of this client that we are auditing. This information we can rely on them more. Why? Because they actually provide you know, a much better source for us to rely on. Another kind of information that we can't classify actually in this framework, which is what we call outsourcing services. And outsourcing services, if the client is relying on any other kind of uh, you know, provider to provide services to them, like accounting, like you know, doing some kind of consulting on certain projects, or they are handling certain tasks, we can go to this third party and obtain the information from them. But we need to be able to see if we can rely on them and how much on this information are uh, you know related to the client or actually generated purely by the third party. Now we are going to be speaking about the nature of information, about what kind of information we need to collect inside the organization to be able to support our conclusion. So the first thing we are going to be speaking about the legal evidence. When we are speaking about the legal evidence, we have four kinds. First, we call it direct evidence. So direct evidence is actually by itself is the uh, fact and conclusion that we can reach without any assumptions. So direct evidence will help us in making sure that actually we know exactly what happened. If someone observes something happening, if we have a video recording it will show that something happening, this is what we consider direct evidence. It's bulletproof, it will show that something actually happened. If we have the supervisor signed on a check and he should not sign, that's a direct evidence. He actually we have an actual direct evidence that he actually did it. however we have something called circumstantial evidence what's the meaning of circumstantial evidence circumstantial evidence it will show that actually something may be happening for certain reason so let's say if we are in the warehouse and we see one of the boxes on the floor and this box broken so in that way we can say that someone actually mishandled that box and the box fell on the floor broken but also, maybe in the warehouse, when there are these boxes stacked over each other, one of these boxes fell down for certain reason, and it's not anyone's fault. But this is where we can say it's circumstantial evidence. Having the box on the floor will show that something actually happened, but we can't actually assess the reason without looking at all the circumstances. Where was that box before? Anyone moved that box? He, he, uh, that this box in the floor fell at what time? We need to look at all the circumstances to assess. So this is what we call circumstantial evidence. So it will help us in figuring out the conclusion, but actually we need to look at all the facts and conditions to be able to assess what actually happened. Conclusive evidence, on the other hand, is completely different. Conclusive evidence will tell us this is exactly what happened. So let's say, go back to the warehouse. Let's say we have coffee on the floor in the warehouse. This is conclusive evidence that actually, because we have that coffee in the warehouse, someone was drinking coffee because the coffee is not going to come itself to the warehouse. So this we call it conclusive evidence that will prove for sure that someone was drinking coffee in the warehouse. And finally, we have what we call cooperative evidence. So cooperative evidence can help us to confirm the facts. 
So let's say you obtain uh, uh, some information from the client. You obtain a uh, sales uh, order from the client. And you want to ensure that this sales order is uh, for a real customer. It's not fictitious sales. So what you do, you actually contact the customer and ask them, have you made this purchase from the client? And if they conform, we consider this as cooperative witness. It's conforming the facts that you collected from the client to ensure that the information that you have with the client, they are correct. So these are the different kinds of uh, information that we can collect related to the legal evidence. Now we have another kind of evidence we need when we are conducting our testing inside the internal audit engagement. And we call them the uh, audit evidence. So the first one is what we call physical information. So physical information is related to the auditor direct observation and inspection. It's related to what the auditors are doing inside the organizations. They are doing inspections, they are taking photos, they are documenting the uh, information. So this is the, exactly what we call this the physical testing. You go, you do cash count. You go, you evaluate the inventory that is existing. This is where you are actually collecting all the information that you need to support your, your conclusion. The second thing is testimonial information. When you are interviewing the client, when you are speaking with the client, the client will provide you so many information about how effective is the internal control, about what's going on inside the organization. Now, this information is testimonial by the client. We can't rely on it 100%, of course, because it's coming directly from the client, and the client, they can manipulate the information. But this is an information that's important for us to use to be able to verify later while we are doing our auditing. The other kind of information we obtain during engagements is what we call it documentary information. And documentary information, actually, these are the documents that we obtain from the client related to uh, the processes. We obtain checks, we obtain uh, you know, reports, and we can use them inside our order to be able to do the testing that we need and support the conclusions that we have. And finally, we have what we call analytical information. So analytical information usually, most likely, will be will obtain using what we call analytical procedures. And what is analytical procedures? Analytical procedures is comparing financial and non-financial information for inconsistency. So we are trying to do com com comparison to be is to see exactly the sales went up, the commission went up with it. So we are trying to assess any indications of anything that will show anything not reasonable. So that way we can do further testing on it. Anything that will show there is no cause and effect between the uh, uh, sales and, um, and commission because usually the sales will cause the commission. So if the commission is going up and this is not going that much up, it looks like there is something going on. So these are the information we discussed. We have the nature of information. We discussed we have the audit evidence. Now we need to speak about the level of persuasiveness of the evidence. How much you can say this evidence are supporting my engagement? where we say we have mainly four levels that we can look at. The first one is the auditor's physical examination. This is the most persuasive way for us as the auditors to say, yes, I believe this is happening. So here, look what we are saying. We are saying it's the physical examination. You as an internal auditor went inside the warehouse and actually looked at the inventory and actually you examined the inventory physically. You, in cash count, you went and you looked at the cash and you counted the cash. You looked at the gold and you weighted the gold. This is, you did a physical examination and this is the most persuasive evidence. The second one is called direct observation by the client. So here, you actually go to the warehouse but you just observe what's happening. You go to the, uh, the cash and see it's there. You are not doing the actual physical examination. You are actually just doing the observation. So this is less persuasive. The second one, is any information obtained by third party. You contacted the banks, you contacted the suppliers, you contacted the customer, and you obtain some information from them. This is the, uh, also more persuasive, definitely, than obtaining the information directly from the client, because the client, they can lie about some uh, issues or they will not give you all the facts. So these are the kind of evidence and information that we collect when we are doing our examination. Now, let's move to understand how can we establish the engagement objectives and scope and then determining the tools and techniques that we need to use to be able to gather the information that we need. Look what the IBBF will say. IBBF related to engagement objectives. Objectives must be established for each engagement. So for each engagement we do, we need to establish the objective. Always the objective for each engagement should start with what, what are we trying to achieve, 
we are trying, for example, we are trying to evaluate account receivables. We are trying to test uh, uh, payroll records. First, we start with what, and then we end up with why. Why we are evaluating account receivables to ensure that account receivables are not over, uh, uh, overdue for more than 30 days. So in that way, we are always assessing the reason why we are doing it. We start with what, we end up with why. So look what they say. They say internal auditors must conduct a preliminary assessment of the risk relevant to the activity under review. Engagement objective reflect the result of the assessment. So it's very critical for internal auditors to do preliminary assessment. We need to do assessment to understand exactly where are the risk areas that we need to focus on. What are these areas? How much testing we need to do? We need to understand what kind of methods we need to use to collect this information. This internal auditors must consider the probability of significant errors, fraud, non-compliance, and other exposures when developing the engagement objectives. So when we are trying to examine any processes, we need to ask ourselves, where are the issues here? Do we expect any errors, risk, mistakes? Maybe in that case, we need to expand our testing. They say adequate criteria are needed to evaluate governance, risk management, and controls Internal auditors must ascertain the extent of which management and the board has established adequate criteria to determine whether objectives and goals have been accomplished. So we need to ask management, do you have internal controls in place? Do you have risk management in place? If they have that, we can most likely say, okay, if you have it, we will test it and we can rely on it if it's working. If they don't have, we actually need to do detailed testing. They say, if adequate, internal auditor must use such criteria for their evaluation. If uh, inadequate, internal auditor must work, uh, must identify appropriate evaluation criteria through discussion with the management. So if management, they already have these criteria and internal control, we can test them. If we believe they are adequate, if we believe the design of these internal controls and risk management, they can, uh, are going to support the organization in achieving the goals. If we believe they are not adequate or they don't have them, we need to discuss with the management and say, based on what we are going to do the testing for these uh, processes. Look what they say. What are these criteria? Usually, they are internal criteria, policy, procedures of the organization. So in that way, we look at the policy and the procedures of the organization. And based on it, we do the testing over the operation. We look at the external, which is laws, regulations by uh, uh, the, the government. Based on that, we will be able to say, are you actually in compliance with the requirement, with the legal requirement? And leading practices, based on your industry, what are the practices that you as an organization, you need to be able to follow when you are doing you know, your, exam, uh, your operation? Now we move to the consulting part. They say, consulting engagement objectives must address governance, risk management, and control processes to extend agree upon the client. If the client, they say, we need your help in establishing internal control, risk management. So in that way, you need to discuss with the client to what extent we, we as internal auditors, we are going to work with you. Are we going to help you in coordinating the activity, facilitating the activity? Are we going to do training? What kind of activity we are going to do here? They say consulting engagement objective must be consistent with the organization values, strategies, and objectives. The meaning when I am helping the client, on a consulting engagement, I need to help the client in actually achieving the goals of the organization, not going f farther away from it. What I'm doing, it should be aligned with the objectives to help the organization achieve its mission. Now, what is the preliminary survey that we, we need to do for us as an internal auditor to support the client in, in actually uh, achieving their goals? Well, they say first, what is the main purpose of having preliminary survey? They say, First, to become familiar with the activity risk and controls. We do the surveys for us to be able to speak with the client and get an understanding. What kind of controls do you have in place? What are the risks related to achieving your objectives? And are these controls that you have in place helping you in reducing your risk so you'll be able to achieve your objectives? What are the processes that you have in place? Understanding that is very critical uh, at the beginning so in that way I will be able to do the testing later. The second thing which is very important 
is I'm getting comments and suggestions from the engagement client. Engagement client, they may say, we have some issues here. Maybe you need to focus your testing here. Maybe you need to look at these areas. So these comments and feedback from the client is very important at the initial stage to understand the expectation of the client, to understand what issues the client is trying to solve here, and we help the client in solving them. Now, what, what kind of uh, tools you can use for you to be able to collect this information during the preliminary survey? They say number one is input from the engagement client. Input from the engagement client is very important. Why? Because this information that you collect from the client, they can help you understand exactly the issues, the problems that the client is facing. Also, will, uh, will help you build relationship with the client and understand what they are expecting from your work at the end. The second thing is analytical procedures. Analytical procedures, as we discussed before, is comparing financial and non-financial information for inconsistency. So it can be used by looking at certain ratios. We can do uh, something called the reasonableness test. We can do something called the period to period test. We are comparing something over time. We can look at the budget compared to the actual. All these kind of testing will help us in assessing if there are any areas that we need to focus on during our testing. Also, we can do interviews. So interviews is a very effective way for us to be able to collect information. We sit down with the management, we sit down with the staff, and we'll be able to collect information from them through these interviews to be able to assess anything that we need actually to consider during our uh, examination. This is a, a very important part to look at. We are gonna discuss that later when we come to uh, to tool uh, gathering techniques. Prior audit reports. Prior audit reports is a very good source. Look at the audits that you did last year, the year before, the year before. What are the issues? Are these issues solved? What about the follow-up? Have they actually addressed everything and they did the corrective action? These issues can help you in understanding what was going on and if these issues still happening or these issues, they have been resolved. So these are the issues that we focus on here to understand how can we benefit from all the audits that we did before in this audit. We can look at process mapping. It's very important when we are looking at the client operation to be able to understand the processes and not all the time it's easy for us to understand it. So what we will do, we create flow charts to explain exactly how these processes inside the client is actually happening, uh, uh, are actually happening. So in that way, where uh, we have uh, decisions inside the process, where we have actually some functions, where we have actually uh, uh, interrelated functions. Understanding this by having flow chart, by creating that data flow chart will help you assess the, the operation later because you can go step by step over this process and see do they have the appropriate internal controls in every area where they should have. Are these internal controls actually working as they should? And finally, we look at something very important, which is what we call a checklist. The checklist for internal auditors is a very useful tool for them to be able to make sure that they will do all the appropriate tests, they will collect all the needed information, so that way auditors can check all these boxes in the list to ensure that they actually done their work without missing or forgetting anything, and it will guide their work. These are the advantages. However, there are some disadvantages for having checklist. One of them, it will give a false sense of assurance. You just check the boxes and you feel you are okay. And sometimes auditors, they feel this is a routine task. So after you do it one time, two times, three times, you feel like as long as you check the boxes, it's okay. So this is one of these advantages. The other one, it's so hard by checking the boxes and saying check and not check, it's okay, it's not okay, to be able to convert this to actual observations, to be able to say, yes, we have an issue here and we need to actually address it. And finally, we need to ensure that when we are looking at this checklist, not all the items in the checklist should have the same weight. Some of them, they are more important than the others, so that way the checklist is not gonna be just a way for you to check the boxes and move on. It should be a way for you to guide you to understand what further testing you need to do in certain areas if you have issues. So these prime are the preliminary survey, you know, uh, tools that we use as auditor to be able to at least get an understanding of the operation of the plant. Now we move to what we call data gathering techniques. What are the data gathering techniques that we have inside our operation to help us assess and understand exactly the operation of the client? The first one is questionnaires. Questionnaires, they are different than what we call surveys. So questionnaires are what? Questionnaires, 
they are like for example internal control questionnaires they are comprehensive set of questions they are designed to get details understanding from the client about what's the operation about what are the internal controls in place are they working or not some questions they they need explanation from the client some questions they are yes or no they are working they are not working questionnaires usually are very useful why because they will help you get a full understanding from the client usually you can send these questionnaires to the client before so he will prepare for it and sometimes we go and do an interview with the client where we sit down with the client and we go over the question one by one one by one to address the issue now there are advantages and there are disadvantages questionnaires they are very useful in helping you gather the information that you need in trying to understand the internal controls however the disadvantages here for internal for questionnaires that questionnaires they are difficult to prepare it will take you a lot of time for you to be able to prepare them so they are also time consuming and also they will not cover all the areas they will cover most of the areas but you know they are not going to cover everything so you need to be careful when you are doing questionnaires that questionnaires are useful but at the same time you know they can they uh, can create issues why because are you asking the question questions or you are looking at the client and interacting with them are you documenting the information these are the issues would happen when you are trying actually to, to uh, work with questions. On the other hand, very important for you as an internal auditor to not only rely on the questionnaire by sending them to the client, but also you need to do interviewing. And interviewing can be done on different stages. So interviewing can be done bef before you start the audit. So in that way, this is what we call it. It's like an introduction where you go and meet the client and explain the value of internal audits. You do awareness session. So that way you, you speak with them in general about their operation and you tell them about what you are going to be doing after three weeks when you come to do an audit. It can be done at the beginning of the uh, uh, audit to uh, collect information from the client to understand the operation of the client. It can be done during the con examination of uh, the client to be able to gather further information when you need them. And also it can be done usually after uh, the, the audit where actually you are just confirming the fact you are doing an exit interview to say these are the observations that we have and these are the conclusions that we reach and how can we work together on solving the issues and implementing the corrective actions. So we have different stages of interview that we need to look at. What are the important issues when we are speaking about interviewing? Number one is planning the interview. You need to make sure when you are speaking with your client that you are planning the interview by understanding exactly the procedures. So don't go and ask the client what policies you have in place. First, request the policy, the procedures, look at them, read them, and then have a, a full understanding, then go ask the client, so that when the client is telling you the information, you are confirming the fact based on what are the procedures and the client is telling you, and you are doing something which is very important, we call it active listening. You are listening to the client and understanding exactly the issues that he is addressing and you are seeing if he is actually following the policy that you read and you understood before or not. So these are very important issues to address. The second thing, scheduling the interview. You need to make sure that you schedule the interview in a time and place where it's convenient for the client. So most likely it's much better to schedule the interview in his office. So in case you need additional documents, you can have it there. Make sure you schedule a time that's convenient for them. So in that way, you have enough time to ask the question. At the same time, it's the time is going to be good for them. You are not bothering them while they are working. And in that case, this will not be supporting their operation. Now, how should you start this interview? You need to ensure that you, you are on time for this interview. You, you are not coming late. You need to uh, uh, speak with the client and explain to them what is the purpose of this interview that you are actually trying here to do the work and what kind of assurance you are going to provide. You need to explain to them what kind of information you are looking to collect from them so in that way if they don't have it with them now they can prepare it in advance and they can provide it to you and you need to make sure you are actually professional with them you are not speaking with them with an aggressive tone you are not threatening them and you are gaining their confidence building relationship with the client is very important when you are conducting this interview because it's going to be or ongoing basis it's not like one interview you are going to start the first interview then you are going to work with them during the audit then after you need to work with them to implement the corrective action conducting this interview is very important to have what we call active listening the communication between you and the client you need to make sure that the client is actually uh, speaking and you are listening to them actively 
you are understanding the issue, you are assessing, you are asking questions at the right time, and you are addressing these issues. You look at the verbal and non-verbal communication. Are their body language saying something different than what they are trying to say? If there are issues, are there some areas where you feel they are under stress or they are not comfortable talking about, and that way you need to be able to assess, are they actually saying the truth or they are lying to you? When they are saying internal controls, they are working. These are the issues that we need to actually address when we are speaking about uh, interviews. Now, other than interviews, for you as an internal auditor, you can do something which is very important, which is what we call it observations. So what is observation? Observation is the ability for internal auditor to watch the physical activities that the employees are performing in real time. So you go, and if they are uh, telling you someone is actually doing uh, accounting for the uh, goods that we are receiving in the warehouse, you can go and you can observe that. Observation is a very important tool for internal auditor to ensure that the event actually happened. However, we need to understand that observation will give you kind of assurance different than other kind of assurance. What's the meaning of it? If you go and you observe the inventory in the warehouse, that will tell you that the inventory in the warehouse actually exists, it's there. But not that will not tell you the ownership of the warehouse, uh, of the inventory in the warehouse. So we need to ensure which technique you are using to provide what kind of assurance. The inventory is there, you observe it, the inventory is there. Who is the actual owner of this inventory? What is the value of that inventory? We can't use observation to assess that. We need actually to do physical examination. We need to go get this inventory, evaluate it. We need to look at the ownership of who actually owns this inventory. We need to examine the records. So we need to ensure whatever technique you are using is actually supporting the objective that you are having. Also, we can use an, an internal survey. Internal survey questionnaires, they are long, comprehensive. Internal surveys, they are short questions direct to be able to help you to get an understanding from the client. Usually survey can be done over the phone. Survey can be sent to the, the client so that way they complete them and you get feedback from them. Survey can be sent to all the employees in, inside the organization or the division to get their feedback quickly. But however, survey can be sometimes misleading. Why? Because the information you are going to get is only based on the individuals who will reply to the survey. So if not everyone is answering your survey, so that way you are not getting all the information that you need. So this is the main challenge in the survey. Telephone and using phone to be able to collect information from the survey is much useful. However, using phone is not going to be that effective because sometimes it's time consuming and not everyone is willing to answer you over the phone compared when you send it to them, they can do it based on the time that they feel comfortable with. Usually we use for survey a rating so that would be from one to five, rate the service or tell me how, uh, how how do you feel that this is working or not working, effective, not effective, designed adequately or not. So that we, these are the kind of questions that we can ask in a survey. Another way for you to be able to collect this information is from external data sources. We can look at external data sources and understand what are the issues happening in this industry. What are uh, you know, the, the issues that this organization is facing? Looking at customer complaints outside the organization, feedback, social media, all these external sources is a way for you to assess are there any issues that we need to address in our audit that we uh, we uh, need to obtain information from from outside the organization to be able to address while we are conducting our audit so as of this we covered all the issues related to what related to what information you need to, to, con to gather during your audit related to how can you establish your engagement objectives and then use the appropriate data gathering techniques to be able to collect the information that you need to support your conclusions